Hi, Mark. How's it, how's it going? Thank you, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. Great. Um, I was just reading a little bit from your book where you were talking about uh, recording in different places with quite a few artists. And I, myself, run a kind of portable recording setup, so I was quite interested in that. Could you maybe talk about some of those albums that you've worked on recording in unusual places? Uh, yeah, um, so I've just kind of made it the way I work these days and the way I've worked for the last 30 years where I just find interesting environments to work in and um, kind of uh, all my gear is portable. So it, it, it helps these days with budgets and in the past it, it's helped with kind of like creating a mood where uh, I made a record with a band called the Neville Brothers in New Orleans and they kind of created a kind of a studio um, that kind of was like more like a swamp and I got like swamp moss and hung it around the studio. It was actually in a like a five-story apartment building and so one of the floors was the whole studio. And then on other records, uh, they they were just kind of like in cool either churches or um, theaters. There was a I had a studio called the Theater for a while, and that's where I made uh, a lot of records and finished uh, Bob Dylan's Time Out of Mind record there, and um, another record called uh, by Willie Nelson called uh, called the Theater. So yeah, so I, I found that by creating these little studio installations that they they actually have a sound for each record. So uh, by working in a normal conventional studio, you fall into all uh, same old studio tricks where if you're working in a new environment, you're, you're going to create different sounds. And so my whole thing is about creating cool new sounds that nobody's ever heard from before. So you get these sounds by working in these type of environments. Can you think about any particular instances where the room ends up being like a real problem and you had to use a lot of kind of manipulation afterwards or has it normally been all right? Uh, it's always been the reverse for me where the room is actually added to the recording for the for the better. And especially like on uh, Tom Waits' Real Gone record where I was recording uh, his record in a, a little old schoolhouse outside of uh, town where he, where he lives in the country and um, so I had some microphones in the bathroom and one of the, the drummer was in there, uh, uh, taking a pee and after he, we had a microphone in there so we could hear him going in there and Tom had asked, was like, what's that sound? And so I said, oh, brains in the bathroom. And then, so after that, we heard brain come out of the stall and the door slammed bang. And Tom goes, what was that? And I go, that was the, the bathroom st- stall door closing he goes i want to use that on the record so i had to go in there and tell brain that he's going to play the bathroom door and then so he would slam it in rhythm boom 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 and so i was recording it and so you know bathrooms always sound super exciting so um so the um, one of the songs uh, on real gone has got this kind of like crazy door sound on it and then i I got him to slap a piece of wood against the wall, so that was the snare drum. And so by, I wouldn't have got these kind of sounds if I was working in a conventional studio. Are you normally recording the whole band together at once then in those sort of spaces? Yeah, so that, that's a bit of a trick of mine. That's how I kind of create a lot of these records, by uh, having everybody play in the same room all together. And I usually tend to have um, find locations that have high ceilings because... They benefit me by having um, the height of the ceiling. It, it allows the sound to go up and doesn't come back down. Where if you're recording in like an apartment or uh, a room or garage or whatever, where the ceiling is low, the sound has nowhere to go but into the microphones, uh, drum mics and stuff like that. So this way I, I can control everything just like you would isolate it. And I would take all the guitar amps and I would isolate them. So Usually it's just a whole band in the room with the drummer. And so sometimes you get some interesting effects where if I have effects on the voice, um, the drums are bleeding into the vocal mic a little bit. And so you get like these slaps or reverbs that you wouldn't norm- wouldn't normally get. So I think uh, there are interesting ways of uh, working that I found that work to my benefit for the sounds of these records. Do you normally go in kind of trying to control bleed a lot or do you only deal with it when it becomes a problem um yeah bleed is is like like i said if it's a if it's a tall room 
Uh, I usually get away with, you know, you can have a stand-up bass player playing right beside the drummer and then, you know, solo drums or bass and you don't hear either one. So it's a it's a unique thing that I found out. And then if if there is like, if the singer is, sings really loud and it does bleed into the um, uh, drum mics. And so sometimes you get a little ghost of a voice in there. And so I try to like mask that with other sounds and stuff like that where you know, you put a, a clap over top of a, a, if the voice comes through in a quiet section or, or you just kind of uh, just see if you can mask that, that vocal with another vocal that's uh, the same kind of uh, uh, the way he was singing, you know. If it's all right with you, I th- thought it would be nice to go through some different instruments, talk about your approaches to recording them. And of course, it varies a lot project by project, but maybe if we start with the drums... In general, do you have a kind of certain approach or favorite mics or techniques? Uh, yeah, with drums, it's it's usually I don't like to use very many microphones, and so with drums, uh, I have a, an RCA forty four ribbon microphone, which I kind of use just for the top of the drums, and then I use like a Coles ribbon microphone for the front of the kit, and so that's basically my sound. And then I'll I'll pepper sometimes like if we need. Uh, more of a close-up hi-hat sound or if I want to trigger certain sounds from the snare uh, I'll put a snare mic up but but usually um, I try to capture the sound of the drums pretty much uh, as you hear them in the room where if you close close mic all the drums you get like a real dead dry drum sound no matter what kind of room you're in even if it's a a real reverberant room the drums will still come back sounding real dry do you normally have to use quite a lot of EQ then with rib mics and kind of minimal mics? Um, no, I, I do. Uh, I, I start with good sounding instruments, first of all. That's that's my secret. you, you got a, a really good sounding drum kit to start with and, and you'll get good sound. Same with guitars. If my my idea, uh, if you got to spend more than you know a minute on a sound, then you don't got a good sound. And so... So to start with a good guitar sound or a good drum sound, that's by miking it, you're just capturing it. So a lot of the recordings I do, I call them gorilla recordings because I don't get sounds. I just kind of get levels and record. And I worry about, you know, if I got to, you know, I don't EQ going to uh, into the machine or um, I, I'll EQ afterwards while I'm mixing, but Generally, I like to keep a really clear path microphone preamp into a tape recorder or whatever recorder I'm using at the time. If you are keeping it simple, then a preamp is quite important to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have uh, custom preamps that I use. So, you know, over the years, I've been a big Neve fan and a big API fan. And so because the way I I work, um, I had these custom handmade preamps made for me. that are uh, all gold pin connector. It's all the best connector, all the best components you can buy. Where a lot of uh, preamps that you buy, the companies are trying to uh, get the price down, so they'll use cheap op amps, they'll use cheap connectors, and and stuff like that. Where I want the opposite. I want build me a, a, a you know a preamp that I can take on the road that is rugged and it sounds amazing. So. These preamps that I'm using, they're called BL99, made by a company called GP2 in Canada. And so they're based off of a API 312 card. And so we've just kind of taken their their ideas and have them built into this kind of a rugged uh, uh, unit. I probably spent more time on the knobs than anything. <laughs> so I kept on coming back with these knobs like, no, I don't like them. And I found these knobs off of old leak amp and uh, this, this is from the 60s. And so I liked the way they felt. And then I ended up um, uh, with with the actual pot themselves. I went with a detented uh, pot so that way you could count how many uh, um, de- detentions you have to find that same same uh, setting so you know by having no eq just plug your microphone in and just make sure you get your same setting on there and you get the same sound every time so um it's been a, a kind of a, a secret little tool for me with those ribbon mics 
especially in kind of unusual situations? Have you ever had problems with damaging them or anything like that? Uh, I, I've, I've had problems with coals dam damaging them by having, um, uh, if you put them in front of a, a loud instrument or a kick drum or something like that, you can pop the ribbon on them. But I came up with this technique where you um, you tape a pencil down the center of a Coles microphone, and you can put it pretty much right on a kick drum, and it's not going to break it. And, um, I've probably broken maybe five Coles in my life, and the the RCA 44 is indestructible. You could drop it off a building, and it probably still work. <laughs> Guess moving on to electric guitar, have you had favorite mics and techniques? Um, I'm a big fan of this microphone called the Sennheiser 409. It's got a gold front, and I'm not sure if you ever saw um, the inside cover of uh, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. There's a, it came with a poster, and it's got a picture of uh, um, uh, uh, David Gilmore singing into one of these Sennheiser 409s. And so what it is, is they're a big diaphragm uh, dynamic mic. And so I like to use them on drums. I like to use them on guitars. And so it's a, it's you know, it's the microphone you know Neil Young always uses on his guitar live. And so I used it on his record that I made with him also. And so yeah, so I always carry a set of four and nines with me. And and uh, I like this other microphone called the AKG D12, which uh, it's a kick drum mic. It's a square block of a mic but it's, it's it's the only one i like to use on kick drums because it's got a, a fatter sound so moving on to bass if you had any favorite mics or techniques um i have a technique for bass that um i particularly kind of just kind of not discovered lately but uh i start with the bass guitar itself where i've been really enjoying um when you use a Hofner bass guitar, there's a certain thing that happens where the frequency, it's kind of like a 250 bump that this that those basses have. And for whatever reason, when you listen on a small speaker or, in, or out of your phone or whatever, the basses are super clear. I'm like, wow, this is pretty interesting. So I found this other bass called a EB2, um, made by, I think it's made by Gibson also. It's the 60s, looks like, um, you know, uh, uh, one of those Mickey Mouse shaped kind of guitars, like a ES or whatever. And um, so, yeah, so that bass also has this little button that you push in and it gives you this punch. And so I, I, I always just take those kind of basses and go direct with them. Don't use a bass amp, and that's been my sound you know, for the last, you know, couple of years where um, I just get the best sounding instrument and then just going in line into the, uh, I have in these preamps, I've got a special kind of um, preamps inside of them for direct inputs. And so it's actually a completely separate op amp that I'm using to the, to the um, microphone preamp inside these, uh, these pre preamps I'm using. So uh, so it, it comes through super punchy, and like I said, I, I get this bass sound that is super clear on a small speaker, which if you're using a P bass or um, other basses that are, you know, uh, or a jazz bass, they tend to be nice, big, and warm sounds, but they, they don't tend to be super clear and poke out uh, on, on a smaller speaker. So I, I don't know who, what it is, but... Uh, I always kind of go with this frequency, uh, 250 hertz, and give that a boost, and that seems to help on those bases too. And maybe rolling off a little bit, a bit of the bottom too, to, for clarity, so it's not too boomy. Um, but yeah, that, that's been my technique with bass over the years. Are you recording with headphones then, normally, with everyone playing live? Um, no, I use. A speaker system that's pretty big and has 18 inch subs and uh, I stack a bunch of um, kind of audios on top of each other and uh, I usually have everything coming out of the speakers super loud and um, uh, I try to get get it so the vocals uh, so the singer can sing into like a beta 58 or a short 58 uh, with the speakers on so that they can hear themselves super clearly without headphones 
and um, and I'll have guitars, drums, everything coming out of the speakers. I just want it to sound like a, a record that they're singing to. And so this has been a, a technique that I've used over the years where instead of headphones, I'll I'll just cut with the speakers on loud and, you know, working in a large room, you, you, again, it's like low um, ice, uh, leakage kind of thing into drums and stuff like that. So uh, I prefer to go with performances and the way to get performances out of people are you need sound pressure by working in headphones. Uh, it's kind of like your pitch gets, you get pitchy and uh, it's not inspiring. You know, it's like you're a guitar player and you're doing your guitar part and you have headphones on, you know, it's, it's, you don't really get so excited, but if you feel it coming out of those speakers and the actual sound is moving your pant legs and like, it's like, it feels like, you know, you're, you know, it's powerful, you know? And so I go with kind of sound pressure, uh, definitely with track. Are you recording digitally these days with portable setup? Uh, yeah, I'm using a Canadian machine called the IZ Radar. It's a 24-track uh, digital machine, and it works just like a tape recorder. And because I grew up on tape, uh, I like to use it because it's got a, a play button, a rewind, and it's got a, a kind of a jog wheel for editing. And so it's all really familiar from the old days. And But I think this is the best-sounding digital recorder out there, uh, you know, I've AB'd it from, against Pro Tools, Logic, you know, everything out there, and this just wins hands down every time, so uh, I think that um, uh, I'm going to continue to use this. I am limited to 24 tracks on, on one machine. I can link them up to another machine and do 48, but I tend to make most of my records with a limitation of uh, 24 tracks, and, and usually 22 tracks, because I like to mix back into the machine, so I come out of the console back into the and through my preamps line input, so it gives the sound of an API desk, and then uh, I print those onto 2324 on the machine, and so I've always got a two-track mix along with the main files, and so um, if I ever have to go back and uh, you know touch up a mix and they just want to have the guitar solo a little louder, I can just put up the two mix and just you know, um, push the fader up for the guitar and overlay it on top of that two mix, and it's a fast way to work. You know? Do you normally bring a desk with you to those spaces as well? Um, these days, I've been uh, the radar is, incorporates uh, um, Pro Tools also, and also has a, um, a thing called Mix Bus, which it's kind of a Harrison console that I can record into, and so I have a touchscreen uh, mixer. Um, on top, so let me just show you. So this, this is the touch screen on top, and then there's the radar un underneath it, and then the preamp. So this is my whole rig right there, and then so um, so I I use the touch screen to when I do these kind of guerrilla recordings out there, and then I come home and then I I mix up a Tascam desk because it's small, it's you know it does everything I need it to, it's automated, and it recalls all my mixes and and then, you know, I have all external effects. So I've got like Evan Tides and um, I, my, one of my secret weapons is the Lexicon Primetime and uh, TC Electronics Fireworks. They're, they're kind of like um, cool little kind of uh, effects. So I tend not to use plugins uh, when I mix and I try to make it as organic as I can. And I think that my mixes kind of, um, they, they, they come around and they sound more uh, analog than digital. Recording things like acoustic guitar in those spaces, is that difficult with everything else coming through the speakers? Um, I have a technique for, uh, I'll track with an acoustic guitar with a DI, uh, so that way you can't use a mic in a room when you're blasting like that. And then I generally come back and then do uh, overdubs with uh, acoustic instruments like uh, acoustic uh, guitars. And, mandolins um, and so on so anything like a piano also sometimes I'll, I'll track with the piano in the room and if the leakage is too bad then I'll, I'll just overdub the piano again acoustically and uh, but generally I've been having really good techniques we just jam in 257s in the top top holes of the piano close the lid and put some blankets on it and it's it's pretty pretty uh, pretty isolated I'm pretty amazed by it 
and it sounds pretty damn good. These 57s are just cheap mics, but they just really, uh, they just, I've been getting crazy cool guitar, I mean, piano sounds. Were you using uh, Shure 58 for people like Tom Waits on those projects too? Um, it's, uh, Tom Waits, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was funny because Tom came to me with a Tascam four track that he had been doing these recordings in his bathroom late at night where he was doing these uh, mouth rhythms and he just kind of like have a 57 plugged into this Tascam uh, tape um, cassette recorder and he didn't know how to record so he just turned everything up full, right? So he, was, he had the microphone in his mouth and he'd be doing these mouth rhythms and like, mm, ah, mm, mm, ah, and then it was overloaded the tape and it was they were coming up with this cool overloaded distortion that that um i thought sounded amazing and so i told tom i said well when we make your record you know we'll re-record all these with like nice better sounding uh, uh microphones and and get a you know more hi-fi sound and so what happens is i got into the studio and i couldn't replicate the sound that i was getting out of this four four track cassette uh task amp. And so I ended up using those those sounds because the bass that he was getting was better than any bass I was ever hearing. You know, like, uh, it was like uh, they were like kick drums and snares that just these mouth rhythms. And so and then he would hit like um, get a pan from his kitchen and like Tong! and the, it's because it was overloaded. It just had this wicked kind of uh, tanky sound, like uh, like he was hitting like you know a submarine or something like that. And so uh, I ended up using these four track uh, uh, cassette recordings for this record called Real Gone. And we overdubbed on top of those. And a lot of the time that was just the, it was just those mouth rhythms with him putting a vocal on top of it. Do you remember what vocal mic you used with uh, Bob Dylan? Uh, I used um, a vocal mic called the Sony C37A. Uh, it's a tube microphone. And I used it on a record called Oh Mercy and then another one called Time Out of Mind. And so Bob doesn't like to wear headphones in the studio, so you have to have a set of stereo speakers set up in front of him. So um, it, it works good. You know, we, we worked in, in on uh, Oh Mercy, everybody all in one room. Like he was in the room with the console and his voice would come out of uh, a set of monitors that they would have set in front of him so he could hear himself and hear the drum machine or whatever, you know, he needed uh, just like a live situation. And then uh, on the Time Out of Mind record, uh, it was a big spitty room in Miami and we did have high ceilings, but it, the room didn't sound good and ended up, I uh, had to have these uh, set of stereo speakers set in front of him so he could hear the track because he wouldn't wear headphones. So yeah, so it was uh, kind of two different techniques, but they both work well for each record. Is there a certain kind of pressure with working with artists with a kind of long legacy like that in terms of what people expect their voice to sound like? Um, I've been lucky because uh, I, especially with Neil Young and, and Dylan, you know, I came up with these sounds vocally for them that um, they just liked automatically. And, you know, it's, it's the delay that I put on their voice along with um, sometimes I do like a little pitch up, pitch down kind of thing. Uh, uh, slightly, but just enough to give it this kind of airiness around it, um, which a lot of people um, point the finger at Phil Collins' vocal sound. But I, I kind of use it in a way that it just kind of more airiness around it. And I, I was working with Robert Plant uh, uh, at one time, and I had put it on his voice, and I thought it sounded amazing. And he goes, Mark, you have to take that Phil Collins sound off my vocal line. I only have like, like long echoes and reverbs on my voice. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so I ended up getting a cool sound, but uh, we just didn't like that, that technique where I was using with, with Dylan and uh, um, stuff like that. Do your methods change much when you're working with producers like Daniel Lamoir as opposed to stuff you're producing yourself? Um, I've been lucky, you know, over the years, you know, definitely working with Dan because um, he's more of a musician and plays with the band and he's more in with the band. And so everything has always been left up to me on how I mic it and, 
and how I make it sound. So a lot of those sounds on those records are are, are my sounds because um, that's the way I had recorded it. And and his sound, you know, with his kind of guitar sound that he came up with, makes those records sound a little more dreamier than um, than with somebody playing without. Because his his whole technique is he runs his guitar through a, um, a chord delay and that's got certain repeats on it and in certain delay times that kind of uh he plays over top of each other and so you hear a lot of that stuff on the u2 records and he kind of came up with that sound and edge kind of took it over and so so yeah definitely with 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 the those records and and even with tom and uh neil young and um dylan they they never questioned their vocals or any of the sounds i just would play it back they would just love the way it sounded immediately and so that's i try to impress uh because of the speaker system i'm using and and the way i've, I've just kind of grown where when we record it i play it back and i want it to sound better than what they thought it would sound originally and so i usually win them over on that on the first playback so uh, it's a bit of a a trip for me also does anything jump out in your memory about working with rem um yeah um i was working in new orleans uh on uh, the monsters record and so they had asked me to come in without their producer and just kind of kind of go through all the songs and stuff like that so uh it was in this big huge mansion uh in new orleans and so the control room was in this big front entrance uh the ballroom really of this house and so um I had it set up so the console and so behind that you had a bunch of couches and, and coffee tables so it was kind of the hangout area and but you recorded in that area also so michael would be laying on the couch you know and just singing in the room and i would run over and pass him a microphone and i'd say let's put that idea down and it's like he goes what I, I can record laying on the couch like this i go yeah yeah and so i had him piping through the speakers and so he really started to get off on being able to not have headphones on, playing with the, the the speakers on super loud, hearing his voice like it's like on a record, and you know with the effects and uh, delays and stuff I had on his voice. So um, yeah, it, that was a, an interesting kind of period for them to because they had only worked in sterile studios before, so working in this environment, they they really dug being a, a, the freedom that they had. Do you remember what mic you often used on the final takes with Michael? Um, with, with those ones, that was, I always use like a beta 58 and I've been using the beta 58 because on the U2 records, Bono, um, he usually does all his vocals in that and he's got a big barrel chested voice and he'll pop, you know, uh, break tube microphone. So you can't get that kind of close with his voice on that. And so I've been using it cause it's a really great, um, sounding microphone. And if you do get a keeper vocal, you can use it because it's not um they're they're nice big round sounds and so a lot of times i can go from using like a u47 and then oh wow the the original vocal that we cut with the band you know that's a better verse and then i'll just kind of you know use that 58 as a verse vocal and then cut back to the 50 to the u47 or whatever and uh it's it's you can't tell you know like i i can match the sound pretty pretty closely you know if you're generally kind of going for a naturalistic sound, is your use of compression quite minimal then? Yeah, I'm, I've gone the opposite. As everybody is using compression, you know, as as a sound and as a as I call it a crutch. A lot of people, you know, just use compressors on everything and then compress the two mix and then gets compressed in mastering. So you get this squash sound. Where I I tend to mix dynamically uh, so my mixes are you get things are very far away in the background and things are very close up and things are on the right and so the way i mix it's things are um have a depth of feel and so once you start compressing all that stuff and then compressing the mix and compressing everything you lose that because it brings everything to the forefront right so by doing that um i became the human compressor where I ride things and so things are quiet and then I'll bring them up loud for the section, bring them back down and kind of like, um, instead of like, cause people just put everything on a compressor 
and they don't ride faders anymore. They don't they, they don't do anything. They just kind of compress it, and everything mixes are very sterile in, in a way and uh, linear because people aren't you know mixing. They're just using compressors as they're bringing it all up to the front kind of thing. And so um, you you know uh, there was a time in the uh, I guess the 90s and into the 2000s where you know everybody was you know running everything through like compression compressor through a compressor through a compressor you know like to squish it as much as they could and and uh, you know so a lot of those records are dated because of that and i've made a lot of records that are timeless because i don't do that i think so uh, i think it's um, i might use a compressor on a on a vocal but a very soft compression and i usually don't track with any compression at all do you use anything on the two bus at the end um sometimes i'll i'll i will try like um uh, an ssl type uh, stereo compressor to see because it has this um a makeup uh a little knob on it that i really like the way it sounds and so sometimes that can make my mixes sound a little more exciting but i tend not to like over over uh, compensate and squish it too much now you've worked with some quite famous country artists as well, like Emily Harris and Willie Nelson. Was there any pressure with them to get a kind of Nashville type sound, or were they deliberately looking for something different? Um, well, definitely on the Amy Lou Harris record, uh, it's called uh, "Wrecking Ball," and it was a it was a big turnaround for Emmy because um, you know she, you know, Daniel Lemuel was producing it, so you know all the songs she had picked were covers, so. A lot of them uh, were uh, like a Dylan song or a Hendrix song, so they weren't that uh, country to start with. And so um, we made a really beautiful record with her, and a lot of the songs have atmosphere, and so they're very anti-country in a way. And so when that record came out and we went out and did a little tour with her, even her crew that had been with her for years were like, Emmy's taken acid and gone to space. What happened to Emmy? You know, like <laughs> they couldn't get a grip on it. You know, like but they were beautiful records. And same with Willie. You know, I made a record called The Teatro, which was uh, was pretty much live off the floor, and I did it in, in this uh, studio I had called The Teatro. And so um, Willie would, you know, pick a song that he was going to do, and so we ended up recording. Uh, two days and I think I recorded 22 songs in two days and Willie would just pick a song and say okay let's try this one and, and I say Willie that's a great song did you just write that one and he goes no I wrote that one in like 1942 and I'm like you can remember a song from 1942 like wow this is an amazing song you never recorded so yeah so that that record was kind of an anti-country record but maybe his best sounding record uh I've, I've had a lot of people's audio files people claim that that teatro record is one of the high fidelity the best fidelity that they've uh, heard in a long time on a willie record obviously you've worked with a lot of big names was there anyone who you were most nervous to meet at the start of the session um not really um you know like neil was always a fan but like when when I'm working, you know, with Bob or any of these people, you're, you're on a work basis, so you know there's no time to be, you know, they're just another human that you're working with. So the the ego and everything is out the window, and you got to work on a on a, a level that you can both communicate. And so communication is key with working with these people. And and I I find that you know winning these people over early on, like with Neil Young. You know, he was, he's been set in his ways all these years, and I thought there's no way I could ever work on a Neil Young record because he's got his own camp and works with his own guys. And so when when he came in to make the, this Lenoise record, I thought, you know, like, how can I, you know, win him over with guitar sounds and stuff like that? Because he's already got the best guitar sounds I've ever heard, you know, on any record. And so um, I came up with a sound uh, for an acoustic on that he had by putting a a sub harmonizer on the acoustic so when he hits the low note he gets like a synth bass plays along with him it's like wow what's that it's like and so it was a direct through a delay into the sub some uh sub harmonizer and then i was playing it back through this my speaker system which had 18 inch subs and you know uh stacked kind of uh 
uh, Dyna Audio speakers, so it was a very impressive playback. So when he played the acoustic, it was like he was getting this uh, sound that he, you know, had never heard before from acoustic. So that excited him, and so I kind of won him over with that sound, and then he said, well, and I think we were, it was another song called Walk With Me, and he said, well, I brought my uh, uh, Les Paul guitar, which he calls Blackie, and so it was supposed to be an acoustic record, so he said, let me try this one uh, with the, the electric, and so I piped his guitar through two little tweed amps, and, and so the the sub-harmonizer was still on from the last track, so when he plugged in and turned it in, uh, turned it on, I turned up the speakers, and then he just hit that chord, and it was like the biggest guitar sound he'd ever heard, you know, with the sub-harmonizer on it. And so he was just like, his face lit up and big smile. So he, that just kind of made him play the certain way. So I think by, you know, by exciting people and getting them to hear sounds that they, you know, that are really impressive, I think that really helps, you know, with with working with them, you know, and so that way you're, you're not uh, intimidated by them at all and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I've never had any problems with, with that. I guess to finish up, do you want to talk a little bit about this book that you've written that's just come out and maybe any other projects that are coming up that you're excited about? Um, well, what's going on is uh, I'm just kind of getting back into into uh, to work because um, about a year and a half ago I got diagnosed with uh, uh, melanoma cancer and it spread to my liver and my brain and so I had to take a year off of everything and uh, and it got kind of spooky at one time, and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it. So um, I, I was kind of like writing down kind of like uh, uh, my life kind of in a, for, um, for my website. I was trying to like put something together for my website. And so I started writing, you know, a little bit of history on myself. And so I ended up, I couldn't stop once I started. So I started to de- dedicate every morning to noon to writing. And so on all these records, I have all these little stories and, you know, so all this stuff started to come to the table. And so I started writing, you know, all these, you know, weird things like, you know, Neil Young, he only works three days before the full moon. and Dylan, he only works at night. And so there's all these like weird little things that happen on these records that nobody knows about. So I started to write that, you know, that what went on behind a lot of these records and how those sounds got there. And then really just stories of, of, of what went on during those records. And even if they weren't musical or whatever, there are so funny stories that would happen. So I ended up with a book. And so I've just put out this book called Listen Up. And it's, a, it's about all these uh, people I've worked with over the years. And so from Robert Plant to Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Tom Waits, Iggy Pop. And so it's each chapter is kind of based off of those records and so there's there's funny stories there's scary stories and there's um so it's 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 really a kind of a book based off of uh, uh stories that they told me and stories that were that happened during the making of these records so uh if you're interested in in any of these people go out pick up a copy of uh, listen up it's on amazon and i think it's coming out in in the uk uh on the 20th of this month so um, I'm sure you could probably still get it off Amazon before then, but uh, if you get a chance, listen up. It'd be great. Great. I'll post some links to it in the description so people can check it out if they're interested. That'd be perfect.